He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Here's a thought experiment. It's 1995. You're an All Black, a Springbok, or even a Wallaby. Or maybe you're a good provincial player. You're ready to bleed for Otago or Western Province. You're one of a small group of people good enough to wear the jersey. But rugby doesn't pay the rent, so you fit in your training around your day job. You're knackered, and you sometimes think, wouldn't it be nice to be paid to do this? And then someone does offer to pay you for it, and pretty well too. But if you say yes, then you can't be part of that tradition, that legacy. You can't wear that jersey anymore. And some people are going to hate you for it. So what do you do? In 1995, this wasn't a thought experiment. It was reality. Rugby was an amateur game played for glory and not for gold. Or at least that was the ideal. I was a reporter in Avalon in Lower Hutt. This is Keith Quinn, obviously. He's the voice of rugby in this country. He remembers going to a farewell party in the late 1970s thrown for new all-black Bernie Fraser at his club. One of the officials came up to me and said, Keith, we've got uh, uh, had a whip around. The businesses of Lower Hutton have got a sum of money to give to Bernie. Would you mind presenting it to him tonight as our going away present? And so I said, sure. This generous gesture, typical of the times, was there to ensure that All Blacks wouldn't suffer financially while they're playing for their country. But I knew that uh, I should have really been reporting this as a breach of the amateur rules. Rugby was an amateur game. No one got paid to play, but not because there was no money in the game. Peter Fitzsimons, he's a journalist now, but he used to be a wallaby lock. He worked that out during his first test match. I was standing at the Sydney Football Stadium singing the national anthem. We've got 40,000 people here. Mum and Dad are paying $65 and the 40,000. Yeah, there must be $2.7 million you know, flowing through the gates here and I'm on 50 bucks a day. Hmm, that's funny. Anyway, let's play. It wasn't about the money, it was about the honour of the jersey. And that was the glory of the game. Kia ora koutou. I'm Justin Gregory. This is Eyewitness. We're going back to 1995 when glory became no longer enough. Rugby was going to go pro, but not before nearly tearing itself in two. In September, the All Blacks defend their Rugby World Cup crown in Japan. Now, they're all pros. They're paid to train and to play, to wear certain logos on their jerseys and boots, swallow certain sports drinks, drive particular cars and wear sponsored undies. But not long ago, six World Cups ago to be precise, it was entirely different. Rugby was played for glory, not for gold. Players were amateurs, although that ideal had been slipping for a while. Basically, rugby was ruthlessly amateur, I'd say, up until early 80s, all but totally amateur through much of the 80s. There was a bit of you know, pocket money here and there, I guess, being handed out, and that if I took money for having anything to do with rugby, I'd be in trouble. By the 1990s, we're no longer talking about small amounts of pocket money. There was this uh, All Blacks club that uh, allowed players to be paid. The rumours were they were, going, they were getting up to 100000 a year just to be available for the All Blacks. They called it shamateurism. Amateurism in name only. Lots of sports did it. In the old days, there was boot money, finding cash stuffed in your boots after a game. In the modern era, there were large expense payments, under-the-table money. There were commercial sponsors for big sports competitions. Athletes did ads, endorsements, implicitly trading off their sporting profile. Everyone winked at the hypocrisy, and occasionally someone was nicked for it. There was also rugby league, which was openly pro, and lots of good union players left to play the game. But some of them stayed and held down full-time jobs. All black Lockie Ian Jones, he was a sparky. I mean, just because the demands of rugby and the training and the, the focus that we had there, I mean, I wasn't spending as much time on the tools as uh, I really should be. So Ian went to work for rugby-aligned Lion Breweries and then Phillips New Zealand. His bosses took care of him, and he's grateful. But players often used every bit of leave they could get, paid and unpaid, to be available to play. Some All Blacks have been on the dole. And if the ABs weren't professional in the sense of being paid, they were pros where it counted. We trained very professionally. Uh, our attitude was very professional. I mean, professionalism isn't just about money, right? By 95, even the Olympics allowed pros to compete. Rugby needed to change. Even the International Rugby Board, the IRB, said so. Then in late March 1995, war broke out on the league fields of Australia, or more importantly, on their TV screens. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch was establishing his pay television channels. 
and he needed product. So he went after rugby league. It was what became known as the Super League War. He sent his operatives out among the rugby league players and signed them up in car parks at midnight. The whole thing burst into the public domain. I think it was the 1st of April, 1995. This player's gone, that player's gone, this club has gone, and it was extraordinary. Kerry Packer held the TV rights to league. He struck back hard. Both sides were waving their checkbooks. The rugby league authorities, led by Packer and Murdoch, were saying, what's your phone number? They'd say 975 They said, right, put a dollar sign in front of it and sign here. And they did. Packer asked for ideas to counter the Murdoch raid, and he got a big one from Sydney lawyer Jeff Levy and a former wallaby called Ross Turnbull. Lawyer, very well connected, more chutzpah than would kill a brown dog. You know, he was this unstoppable force. Turnbull, with Levy and a lawyer called Michael Hill, pitched the World Rugby Corporation, or WRC, a global professional rugby franchise, played in Europe, America, the Pacific and Africa, giving more power to the players and transforming rugby into a global TV phenomenon. It was a glorious idea and it was dreamed up by three huge fans of the game. Packer put up $4 million of seed money and Turnbull flew around the world, sharing the vision and quietly signing up players. The boards heard the whispers, and they went slow to see the threat. So in April 95, they talked to Rupert Murdoch, and two months later, at Alice Park in Johannesburg, on the 23rd of June 1995, just one day before the World Cup final, the South African, New Zealand and Australian rugby boards announced the Sanzar deal. Twelve professional rugby teams, a Tri-Nations Test Series, all paid for by a $555 million, that's US dollars by the way, TV rights deal. Keith Quinn was there. Behind the media, down on the playing field of Ellis Park, I can remember the All Blacks were doing the captain's walk around the ground, very slowly tossing a ball around, and it was almost like they were saying goodbye to the amateur era. Sanzard's announcement was meant to be a Jonah Lomu-style sidestep around the threat. Deft, devastating, dismissive. But some of the players felt that they'd been sidestepped too, because no one had spoken to them yet. The Murdoch crowd dealt with representatives of the rugby unions, but the rugby unions never talked to their own players. And time signalled on. Asked if the South Africans are ready, kicking away to his right, just as he did... Ian Jones didn't care. He says all he wanted to be was an All Black and win the World Cup. We're over there to do a job and, and, and play rugby and, and you know, probably didn't need any other distractions. The All Blacks didn't win the World Cup final, that's another story. But what Fitzsimons calls the rugby war was on. So to recap, Rupert Murdoch has Super League and Sansa. Kerry Packer had Australian Rugby League, the ARL, and was backing WRC, the World Rugby Corporation. One side had tradition, pride and some money. The other had the big vision and the promise of big paychecks. And as time went on, they had most of the players too. Teams signed contracts together, one in, all in. 400 to 500 provincial or international players went with WRC. And they were men of mana. The All Blacks captain Sean Fitzpatrick, Wallabies captain Phil Kearns, and the world champion Springboks captain Francois Pinar. Pretty soon WRC had the aura of being where real rugby was. Ian Jones. For rugby to keep its integrity, us to keep playing at the very highest level, which is international rugby, it was almost one and all and otherwise it wasn't really the international game that we know and we love. And whatever happens in the future, we hope that you and the union support us. Thank you very much. When the news broke, officials, fans and one rugby journalist in particular were furious. I wrote a piece in the Sydney Morning Herald, sort of leading the fight back, saying, what is wrong with you blokes? Rugby union is your mother. She's raised you. She's held chook raffles to raise the money to send you around the world to, to be a more honoured figure than you could ever hope for. And now it happens that mum has come into a lot of money and you're going to get your fair share. But if that's not enough for you, if you want mum to whore for you too, to squeeze out the last stinking dollar and you'll trash the, you'll trash the all-black jersey, the wallaby jersey, the springbok jersey, because of etc., etc. Et and I meant it. I meant every word of it. Might have been a bit heated looking back upon it. <laughs> if this was a movie, we'd have a montage now for the next few weeks in rugby's civil war. 
July the 5th, NZRU make their pitch to the ABs, offering about a fifth of the WRC money, maybe $150,000 per player. They get an underwhelming response. Jock Hobbs and Brian Lahore start the fight back, Hobbs travelling the country from end to end trying to change players' minds. Similar moves take place in Australia and South Africa. Players and officials start avoiding each other and tense exchanges occur when they can't. And on the 3rd of August, Ross Turnbull gets the three big teams together to affirm their commitment to WRC. This was the early days of what you and I know as Skype, but they had this satellite transmission where they had 10 famous All Blacks in Auckland, they had 10 famous Wallabies in Sydney, and they had 10 famous, well, as it turned out, nine famous Springboks in Johannesburg. But there was only one question. Where's Francois? Where is Francois Pina? And what had happened was, Francois wasn't there. Francois had come under extraordinary pressure, extraordinary pressure from both sides. But in the end, he had decided to go with the forces of Murdoch. That was the end of, really just about the end of the Packer fight. When Pinar was a no-show, it was clear the Springboks were wavering, and Ian Jones says it was the turning point. All the nations, not just the All Blacks, had to be in this together. And as soon as Francois wasn't in that room, clearly the Springboks weren't going to be at full strength. Clearly the Springboks may not even have been involved in WRC, and you can't have international rugby without an All Black South African rivalry. It's not international rugby. Support trickles away from WRC. Kerry Packer decides to stop funding them. The South African players sign back with their official union. The storm for South African rugby has passed. Uh, the Packer threat is no longer. The, the Springboks have met with SAFA and they've agreed that SAFA can make them happy and that the, the contracts that are being offered will be good and that they can continue playing for Springbok rugby. On the 16th of August, the ARU announces all the Wallabies are back within the fold and Captain Phil Kern says WRC is over. The same day, NZRU call a press conference to announce that they've signed five provincial teams as well as two all-black stars. I am holding letters from lawyers acting for Jeff Wilson and Josh Cronfeld confirming that these two all-blacks will sign contracts with the New Zealand Rugby Football Union. It was one out, all out, because on the next day, the 11th of August, the remaining all-blacks approach Hobbs to say they want to talk. A press conference is planned to announce their reunion, and Sean Fitzpatrick will front for the players. And Jock said, yeah, yeah, and when you look at the news tonight, you'll see him put down a can of Coke on the table in front of him. He has an endorsement from Coca-Cola coming his way. And sure enough, when I looked at the news that night, there was a can of Coca-Cola sitting uh, on the table placed carefully in front of him. Just five months after it was first imagined, and after three weeks of war, WRC was dead. Why? It was a grand idea. Was it just because they didn't have any money? Packer only put up four or five million dollars, and it was done, most of it was done with smoke and mirrors. Very few players got solid money up front, and it had this grand vision of franchises around the world. And you know, there'd be a team in New York that would fly to fly to London and fly on to play to Paris, and all this this grand vision, which I must say at the time seemed absolutely absurd. But really, the irony is, as time has gone on, it was actually fairly visionary because rugby, as the years go by, looks more and more like that. Match up again, New Zealand maintaining possession. Wide to Lomu. He's got and WRC the never had Jonah Lomu, the biggest star in rugby. Lomu! Oh, oh. Now, I've always thought that however much you in New Zealand loved Lomu, in Australia, we loved him more. You know, I went through all seven matches that the All Blacks played in that World Cup. I had never seen anything like him. And I described him in the Herald as a freight train in ballet shoes. This guy could go through you, he could go around you, he could go over you, he, he just couldn't be stopped. And Rupert Murdoch was watching that match in London and his words were, I have to have that guy. On the 27th of August 1995, the IIB, Rugby's world boss, announced that the game was no longer amateur. Rugby's civil war was over. In 1996, the first season of Super 12 rugby started and the Auckland Blues won. Imagine that. The All Blacks crushed the first Tri-Nations Championship and everyone who played got to wear the jersey, be a part of that tradition and get paid. Rugby's changed, there's no doubt about it, and so is the world it's played in and watched in. In 2019, with all that change, do we still love the game as much as we used to? Ian Jones.
Yes, I do, without question. There's still an absolute love for a game, an absolute desire to watch it if they can, play it if, if they're able, and that pleases me. Keith Quinn? Uh, I don't think we do, but uh, you'd have to ask the kids of today whether they love the All Blacks, and they wouldn't be able to judge it against uh, the, the the way that the game was loved and admired in the good old days. And I'll let you into a little secret here. Maybe last season it was the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra was playing the Elgar Cello Concerto at 7 o'clock in the Michael Fowler Centre and the kickoff down the road was the Hurricanes playing a 7-15 match and I went to the concert uh, of, the, of the NZSO and came home and later on put on the replay of the Hurricanes and watched them play. And so there's been some changes in perspective in my life and my, shall we say, middle years. Peter Fitzsimons. Mm. Well, I don't. It doesn't have the honour and glory and compelling nature that it used to have for me. But the three great traditions of rugby are shaking hands before the match, shaking hands after the match, and retiring and whinging that the game was much better in your day. This episode of Eyewitness was produced by me, Justin Gregory. The engineers were Rangi Powick, Jana Witter and Flo Wilson. Tim Watkin is the executive producer. For more on the story, you can read, or you can watch, Keith Quinn's Legends of the All Blacks, or you can read Peter Fitzsimon's book, The Rugby War. We used audio from Nataunga Sound and Vision. Thank you very much for that. And we acknowledge the authorship of the haka Kamate by Natitoa Rangatira Chief Te Rauparaha. You can subscribe to Eyewitness on Spotify or Stitcher, Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, or at rnz.co.nz. And when you're on Apple, please give us a rating by clicking on the stars. Cheers for that. RNZ's podcast team has just had some big wins at both the 2019 New Zealand Radio Awards and the New York Festival's Radio Awards. Gone Fishing, our true crime podcast made with stuff, and Beyond Kate, exploring 125 years of women's suffrage in New Zealand, they both won gold in New York, with Gone Fishing also picking up best podcast back here. Bang, RNZ's Sex, Sexuality and Relationships podcast, that won bronze in New York, and history series Black Sheep, which is all about our nation's villainous past, was a finalist at both competitions. We're proud of these series. We think you'll love them if you don't already, and you can find them at all the good podcast providers, and of course at rnz.co.nz. Matewa.